Now it's true what's been said about me to some extent, that I have travelled the world and I have been interested in the origins of uh, Jewish uh, communities, and particularly Jewish communities in Africa and Asia. And so, um, you know, you get to a certain point uh, in your historical research when it comes to weird and woolly claims in the middle of Africa of Jewish origins, and you can't take it any further. And this happened to me in about 1997, and it was about at that point that I turned to genetics to see if genetics could help what otherwise was an intractable historical problem. There simply wasn't a window into the past to answer the question, are these people really of Jewish origin as they claim to be? And in the case, for instance, of the Lemba people of Central and Southern Africa, the use of DNA was remarkably successful and provided this window into the past which suggested that they did indeed have a Jewish origin. And I used the same kind of technique among other groups, um, for instance, the Bene Israel in India uh, and various other groups uh, throughout the world. And while I was doing this, I was very aware of the fact that side by side with these groups who've got plausible uh, Jewish uh, antecedents, origins, histories, there were also lots of groups in the world who were claiming to be Jewish, wanting to be Jewish, behaving as if they were Jewish, and who probably weren't. And I've written quite a lot about the processes whereby people might be constructed as Jews either by missionaries or uh, by colonial agents in different parts of the world and particularly in Africa uh, and Asia. And all this is extremely interesting in the case of Africa and Asia. There are millions and millions and millions of people today who think they're Jewish, who claim Israelite origins, and we've heard from uh, Sergio that there are about four, 14 and a half million uh, Jews in the world. There probably are something like the same number of people in the world who claim Jewish antecedents. So this is the kind of backdrop to what I started to work on just about a year ago. I'd known that from about um, 2010, a few people had started researching this very topic. And so, for instance, in the northwest corner, Senegal, there's a very, very good book that's published five or six years ago, looking at quite a number of small communities that fled Spain, Portugal particularly, and they maintained some kind of Jewish presence in four or five villages until about 1600. Very interesting. But as I started researching, I discovered that not only were there Jewish communities in the northwest corner of Africa, but going right down the coast, um, almost as far, in fact, as far as Angola, there were implantations of Sephardi Jews. I found this very, very interesting. And there were even maps going back to the great date of 1487, and then another map, 1492, which said that a certain bay um, near the Niger River was called the Bay of the Jews, both in Spanish and Portuguese. I thought, what's all this about? The Bay of the Jews at the end of the 15th? So this started to really intrigue me. And I collected masses and masses of material. I'm going to be finishing a book towards the end of the year on this very topic. And particularly what I discovered, and this was very, very exciting, was a new community that nobody would ever written about. A Jewish community that nobody would ever written about.
I'm supposed to be the expert on African Jews, and this was an African Jewish community that I didn't know about. And it was in a place called Loango. Now, Loango is pretty much exactly on the equator. And we know that at the end of the 15th century, a tragic story, a very typical story of the Inquisition and of the expulsions from Portugal and Spain, hundreds of Jewish orphans had been exiled to an island just off the coast of uh, Africa. Um, and we don't really know much about what happened to them. Uh, we know that a hundred years later there were still some traces of Judaism, but probably not very much. Then the rumor is that many of them went to Portugal, uh, to, to Brazil, and then possibilities that some of them may have gone and emerged somehow into the African population of the mainland. And over this same period, I've been thinking about this, the energy among uh, Anosim, among Jews who were fleeing the Inquisition, was extraordinary. So they fled into the hinterland of Africa. They went up the rivers. They merged with the local populations. They did this in West Africa. They did this in East Africa. And they did this all up the, uh, the western coast of India. It's very, very interesting. I was extremely fascinated by this, and I wanted to know what happened to them. And so then, all of a sudden, I came across a reference. And I don't have any PowerPoints to lose. All I've got is old-fashioned pages, which I can lose, of course. So, the basic story, then, is that we have the Jewish orphans who went to Sao Tome, the Jewish or orphans who were exiled to Sao Tome. That's one of the stories. We also know that lots of other um, uh, Jews fleeing the Inquisition settled in very, very tiny numbers along the coast, and there are periodic references to them. And then, just a couple of years before the uh, French Revolution, um, a missionary, a German missionary by the, by the name of Oldendorp, was given the task of going to one of the Danish colonial possessions um, to write a report on the slave trade and what happened to the slaves once they got to the Caribbean. And this guy, Oldendorp, was a fine scholar. And he set about his task with a great sense of organization, rigor, as well as vigor. And he sat down with the slaves, he interrogated them, he wanted to know every detail of their past lives. And his book is probably the best source that we've got on the internal history of Africa at the end of the 18th century. And so, among other things, he was talking to one of the slaves who was from this place, Loango, and he said, yeah, well, I, I came through Loango. And he said, what was it like? He said, well, an interesting place. There are Jews living there. And this is what he said about the Jews in Loango. So he said, according to his informants, Jews were said to have been ex expelled from San Tome Island, and it was from these banished Jews that the black Portuguese and the black Jews of Loango, who were despised even by the local bl black population, were descended. The slave, Oldendorp's informant, gave further detail. Remember, this is at the end of the 18th century, and the San Tome children were exiled um, some uh, 300 years before. So he says, the Jews were so scorned by the Negroes that they will not eat with them. They have their own burial ground, which is located far from the dwellings of the Negroes. 
Their graves are of masonry and figures of snakes, lizards and the like are painted on them by those who bury the body. This appears ridiculous to the Negroes since such paintings are so dissimilar to Jewish practices the assumption is perhaps not improbably that the writing or letters on the Jewish graves appeared to the Negroes to be pictures of snakes, lizards, and so forth. In other words, the idea was, according to Oldendorp, that the writing on the graves was actually Hebrew. The Negroes may have been, I'm using Negroes, of course, this is the term that was used in the, in the writing about them at the time, um, that they may have had some knowledge of, uh, of Portuguese, but they didn't recognize the Hebrew letters, and so therefore they thought that they were snakes and lizards. Now, when I came across that, I thought it was very, very interesting. There's just about enough detail to be able to say something about this putative community. And so I started digging a little bit deeper. And compared with what I subsequently found, this initial description of an unknown Jewish community was of totally without any interest. Because the real interest of the matter was what this passage meant to people at the end of the 18th century and for the rest of the 19th century. Because this community of black Jews in Loango became a litmus test for the men of the Enlightenment, both in Germany, France, England, at the end of the 18th century, and throughout the 19th century, they were constantly, constantly, constantly being referred to in the scientific le literature that was dealing with a variety of issues, um, from color to race to disease to sexuality. All kinds of things would come back to the issue of the black Jews of Loango. And the reason that they were of interest the reason that they got under the skin of the observers at the time was because they were black Jews, because they were hybrids. How could they be both black and Jewish? You should remember that at the beginning of the 19th century, it simply was not known how color was created. It was thought at the time, for instance, that if you put an Englishman on the equator and left him there for a generation or two, he would turn black. So there was no sense of how color was generated. By the middle of the 19th century, about, about 1850, for the first time, people started to think that there was maybe such a thing as race. One of the great preoccupations of the 19th century was the divisions between people, right? And the more foreigners came to Europe and the more Europeans were in touch with people from Africa and Asia, the more uh, they were interested in these issues. Now, in many of the discussions of, of race and the reality of race or the irreality of race, these black Jews of Liango formed a part. All of the discussions um, over a period of 100 years about race and the origins of race uh, came back uh, to some discussion, big or small, of the black Jews of Luango that nobody in the world has ever heard of. By the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the ideas had somewhat changed. Um, in 1850, uh, there was a very great um, physical anthropologist by the name of André who was claiming that the Jews were the purest race in the world um, and you only had to look at the um, Roman or Assyrian reliefs uh, to say and, and then to look at the face of any Jew that you might see to be able to argue that yes, the, the Jews haven't changed over 2,000 years, they are the one pure race in the world and this is a very great and a very admirable thing. By 1900, 50 years of intense physical anthropology had produced a very different idea. 
and this was carried out very largely by German physical anthropologists, and that was that race did not exist, and certainly did not exist among Jews, because it was observed on the basis of craniometry and various other things that were practiced at the time, that Jews tended to look exactly like the people among whom they lived. So it's ironic that in Germany, knowing what was to happen subsequently, German scientists, German anthropologists had decided that there was no such thing as a Jewish race. And one of the proofs of the fact that there was no such thing as a Jewish race uh, were the black Jews of Loango, who was consistently described by about um, 1900 as being black and practices of a Jewish religion, but not racially Jewish. And I think I'm overrunning. So it was a most unexpected story. It's a fascinating story, and in a way it's a tragic story. It starts off with a violent act against Jewish orphans, and it finishes up bizarrely, weirdly, in 1943, 1943, German soldiers are being sent east to slaughter Jews. But they couldn't be sent east to slaughter Jews without being given some kind of information about Jews. So a book was produced by some of the Judaic scholars that the Nazis exploited, used, crazy. And the book was called the Jew as World Parasite. And in this book, The Jew as World Parasite, here again we have a little description of the black Jews of Loango. And so these Nazi soldiers were told, in the event that you go to Poland or Latvia and you come across any black Jews of Loango, you don't have to kill them because they're Jews by religion but they're not Jews by race. Thank you very much.